at least from a brand perspective, we're uh, an Australian-based but multi-region um, buy now, pay later business. Um, started in Australia uh, in 2000 and I'm going to test our onboarding material, 2014, 2013, 2014, there or thereabouts. Yeah, 13, I'd say, I think so. Yep. Uh, normal consumer finance type products, but expanding into uh, wallet and uh, business products. Um, I think we'll stop there in terms of the business context, but uh, that's a little bit about who Zip is. Um, in terms of international points of presence, uh, we're in Australia, New Zealand, UK, US, Canada, Mexico, UAE, UAE uh, Czech Republic, as of today, I think, and South Africa, I think. I'm sure that there might be one or two that we're missing, but uh, that, that's where we are globally. Um, our implementation of Snowplow at the moment is focused on uh, the Australian market, but uh, we're obviously having conversations about expanding that to other regions. Righto, let's get into it. Um, so take it away, Schmitty. All right. Uh, so there's a lot, like there's a, there's a canvas that accompanies and describes what our um, data platform reference architecture is. Uh, but for the sake of today, we'll constrain it to the parts that are directly attached to or, or relevant to, uh, to Snowplow. Um, we've obviously got Snowplow and related trackers um, on, on the client side of things. That's basically our giant data machine. From an extraction perspective, amongst other tools, we look, we've got Fivetrain on board. We're currently evaluating Airbyte for an internal equivalent. Not exactly the same, but it's considered an equivalent. Uh, DDT from a transformation perspective in favor of uh, Scala, Python, Spark jobs. Um, the, the strength of that is that it's SQL as a first class citizen uh, and is doesn't need the breadth and depth of um, Spark plus Scala knowledge uh, from an engineering perspective. Uh, we onboarded Snowflake as our data warehouse roughly at the same at exactly the same time that we implemented this. Uh, there might have been a few days difference, but um, so that, that's a recent addition to our technology stack. And there's a lot of very nice hand in glove as we go through this technology stack. Uh, then on the consumption side, this is more about once it goes through the machine, uh, how do we make it accessible to the analysts, data scientists, engineers, and other product teams within the organization? Um, historically, we use Amplitude. It's a bit of a spaghetti ball mess, but the intent of this is to clean that up in terms of cleanliness and reliability of data. Um, Pablo, from a business reporting perspective and uh, full story in terms of that complementary capturing the user journey to accompany the analytical data as we go through at a high level. There is actually a lot more to our technology stack, but for the sake of today's discussion, we'll limit it to that. All right. Do you want to take this one? Uh, maybe let, let's tag team on this one. Easy. So I'll talk a little bit about the start of, like, I guess, some of the decision process in, in the snowplow side of stuff. And then I'll pass back to Schmidt to talk through a bit more about the nuances of some of the zip decisions that were made um, around how we deployed it. So um, we evaluated quite a few different options in the kind of event collection, I guess, um, group of, of software out there. It seems that there's quite a lot of things that kind of extend into it. Like you could kind of say, look, Amplitude segment both extend into it, but Amplitude's more on the, the primary side of the visualization, segments more on the primary side of sort of moving data around. So one of the aspects that we really liked about uh, Snowplow was the really highly opinionated way. It was kind of just event collection on that point. Um, so that ability for us to enforce really high quality data structures um, was super appealing. It was a problem that we'd faced in a lot of other areas, I guess, um, over the history of Zip where, you know, someone might define a customer in one way, in one event, define it a slightly different way in another event. So that ability for us to have these shared contexts um, in our Igloo skin registry, um, be able to share those was really, really appealing. Um, basically meaning that we can just spend our time on you know, maintaining a single good version of an object rather than trying to maintain sort of a whole bunch of different versions of one object um, somewhat poorly. Um, the scalability side was super appealing to us. Um, and I think the community side was another aspect that was pretty appealing. Um, when we kind of went through and evaluated a whole bunch of different areas of our stack, 
um, at the same time, um, as Sri alluded to with the snowflake coming online at a similar point in time. One of the aspects that became quickly apparent was it, you can kind of chop and change a bunch of the stacks, um, whether it's like the data warehouse component, the event collection component, the data transform layer, but there's like some pretty common patterns that just make life a lot easier. Um, and Snowplow and Snowflake seem to be one of those patterns to us. Um, and finally, the open source nature was really appealing to us um, in terms of not having to worry about how many events you send to an event collection platform. That was massive. Um, and it was another one of the driving factors in the decision. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of how did we take it and make it our own? Um, again, kind of piggybacking off the, uh, on, off the community side and we run the open source uh, in, installation internally. Uh, we deploy it on uh, AWS EKS uh, with the Kafka backbone. Um, I, I think that one of the early conscious decision points as to why would we run it ourselves is that the, uh, the underlying infrastructure that enables this to run very well and very reliably was already in place. So we already had uh, an EKS cluster in place and in a number of environments and there's, a, uh, there's an engineering team pointed at maintaining, curating uh, and <laughs> operationalizing our Kubernetes installation, it's not something that we as a team need to main, uh, maintain ourselves. So that was good. Um, and by extension, uh, Kafka as the backbone was critically important. One, because it was supported out of the box. Two, because it was something that we were already running. So we've got Kafka as, as a capability pretty much uh, across the almost entirety of the platform, I'd say. But uh, again, it didn't take too much more than a bit of configuration and some automation uh, to make that happen. Um, for us, the relationship between Kafka and the rest of our data ecosystem was critically important. Yes, we could do with Kinesis, uh, but from, from our perspective, the tools that we wanted to connect into and the services that we wanted to enable are predominantly uh, JVM-centric, so using Kafka uh, just made sense. Um, on, the, on the schema registry side of things, our, our implementation is basically an Nginx container with a directory structure that looks correct with some linking from a CI CD pipeline perspective. So it's, it's basic, but it does the job. Uh, I know that there are uh, different uh, patterns and practices and services and components that are available to enable that through like a dynamic API based one. But for us, we got the reliability, the, um, and the immutability of a schema registry that's version controlled and automated and managed uh, and deployed into our environment the way that we currently do. And it didn't take any more automation on top of that. Um, we took, so I must mention that one of the strengths is that it, the, this whole ecosystem is, is nicely opinionated. In, in my view, I think that where you're providing an analytics capability, which is general purpose in nature, you need some pretty strong opinions around you know, how to use it. Otherwise uh, you'll, you know, one of the intents I think behind this was to clean up a lot of the mess that we've got with first party data ownership where right now we spray it into the internet and try and make sense of it after the fact. Uh, if you don't come into this exercise with a nice clean implementation with strongly held opinion in terms of what looks good for your organization, you might be setting yourself up for a bit of a failure. So um, we took the, the Web Tracker SDK and added our own version of, you know, what plugins do we install what plugins do we extend it with? What's the default configuration? Um, what's the just enough for the product teams to make this accessible and easy to implement rather than expecting them to go to the Snowplow documentation and start from scratch every single time? Uh, we've got a fair amount of traction in that way. Um, uh, in terms of the event structure, one of the, one of the basic enrichments that we put in place is just using the API enrichment. Uh, we take the app ID on ingest and do a sense check against an internal registry of, uh, of applications. If uh, it's, this is a bit of a protection against junk data, I think externally, but also to stop teams from polluting otherwise clean data. And I, I think you know, from, from our side of things and the meta of this is that we wanted to increase the liability and trust that the organization has in our data. So we wanted to make sure that we were only capturing we, we had multiple environments like most technology organizations do, but we wanted to make sure that production data wasn't being polluted with some dev that's off hacking something, for instance, um, where it, it's not being tested, it's not being QA'd, it's not ready for production. 
I think just to just to elaborate on that point for, for a minute, because I think this one's super important um, and it's kind of been useful already. Um, so because we we enrich that event data coming through with actual team names, um, it means that like as an analyst working in say Snowflake on the data warehouse, going, hey, what's this event? Um, you've always got that team name tightly coupled to it. Um, so even if you've got like say page views coming from you know 10, 20 different front end services. Um, you can still go back and say, hey, this one actually came from this team. Um, and it's been already really, really valuable in us being able to try and make sense of some stuff when it comes through. Um, and hopefully in the future as well, will potentially help us be able to feed back to the team um, on some of the more operational sides of event volumes and that type of stuff as well. Correct. Um, one of the things that's in our backlog is on the on bad event ha handling. Um, right now, we just basically push it out sort of uh, to Elasticsearch for just operational uh, exploration basically but what we want to do is we don't necessarily want an enablement team to be in the center of you know 10 15 20 or more product teams in terms of good good quality data or not so good quality data so we want to tell the teams directly when their enrichment is or their events are failing in production usually it's because of data quality um, data quality issues um, there's just no environment like production in terms of test data. So uh, some of the quirks that we experience is where everything is well-defined and, and behaving as it should be, but the reality of production is seeing a, a, a property on a context or an event that's missing that should be populated or the wrong data type where it needs to be a number or something to that effect. Um, I, I think just uh, the last one here, you sort of elaborating what I mentioned before with like some generic tracking structures, um, we've already started to see a heap of value with this. One of the sets of tracking structures that or data structures that we spent a lot of time on already is funnels um, and sort of setting up a core set of events. Um, at the moment, it's composed of four, a funnel start, a funnel outcome, and then we break funnels into sections. Um, and again, we've got a section start and section outcome. So due to the composability nature of all the different contexts that we build out, um, this means that we can actually have the same underlying data structures for the funnels for say an acquisition funnel or a checkout funnel. And especially once we start getting into more complex visualizations around um, funnels where you can you know, go through loops, skip steps, et cetera. Um, the time that we spend on doing the data processing for those funnels and those visualizations, um, it's pretty portable to other funnels. So you know, if we go out there and decide to instrument another funnel with the same set, um, all the data processing layers that we've already got in place for the most part, are, are really nicely transposable. Okay, so um, I, I think uh, Moss has already kind of touched on the how do we use it. And at the moment, we've got it embedded in our mobile app. We've got it embedded on this, the Australian region web properties. Uh, this isn't ready for multi-region just yet, as I alluded to earlier, but uh, for right now, we've got it in, I'd probably say the majority of our main customer journeys. So the ability to sign up, if you're looking at the website uh, and uh, when you're going through an online checkout and in mobile. Oh, so hi. those are the main points of presence. Hello. Um, obviously there's more gaps to fill and the business value of being able to link uh, one particular journey to another, even though they're disparate applications is something that we're just starting to realize now that these applications have been in production for quite a while and there's more and more coming on board. So you're getting a better visibility across teams in terms of how it all hangs together. Um, so it's a little bit of the how we're using it. We didn't really cover that in, in terms of the material here, but um, these in, these uh, initial challenges are ours, you know, to to take the quote from Full Metal Jacket or a version of it. There are there are many like it, but this one is mine. Uh, this is this is my gun. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I think is the full line from the movie. But anyway, so um, where you're running the managed service, I think you, these are probably not as big a deal. But these are some of the initial, uh, I'll say challenges. They weren't really even hurdles because they were ultimately solved within a week. There's, we didn't really go back to basics and revisit a lot of the major decisions we made. Um, the first point I was just thinking about qualifying this just before we started the presentation is that the, the tooling is fairly rudimentary if your implementation, like it, assuming you go the, the self-hosted route, right? I think a lot of this is entrenched in that. Um, the tooling is fairly rudimentary unless you 
exactly mirror the way that Snowflake runs their host solution. Oh, sorry, Snowplow. Damn. It's <laughs> going to happen once. <laughs> sorry, it's going to happen at least once. Apologies. Um, uh, yeah, if your implementation differs in any way from the way that Snowplow very consciously uh, runs their operation, our observation is, is that the, the the very generous uh, open source ecosystem um, takes a bit of work to, to make it work or to come up with your own equivalent uh, for some of those capabilities, particularly like shredding raw event data into semi-structured uh, information in, in readiness for your data warehouse ingest. Um, one of the things that was a pleasant surprise, I'll say, uh, was the explosion in volume. So initially we just had it in one very small place in our mobile app, and I think in a single release, a very diligent and keen engineer went and put it everywhere. Um, and it was a, it was an exciting day when uh, that app really started hitting, hitting critical volume in terms of users. So that was a lot of fun. Um, it was less of an operational problem in terms of the ability to service the the inbound events. Um, for as a point of reference, even though self hosting we get a ridiculous amount of performance out of uh, not very many pods running in production. I think it's worth calling out. This is a very, very well-performing system that we don't really need to uh, nurse too much. Um, there's a couple of beginner questions to this point, and I need to thank Mike for his very patient answers to some of this, uh, to some of these questions from time to time. But um, you know, as, as you're building out your operational dashboards and you can pick your data dogs or new relics or whatever you like to monitor this stuff in the back end. Uh, getting an appreciation of what normal event behavior looks like is, it takes a little while, but there's obviously like load moments that go on. Like uh, a good example for me is um, watching the, the collector good events versus the enricher good events and, and the delta between the two in terms of event volume is something that we monitor. Um, seeing a line between the two had me concerned for about an hour uh, at which point I hit Mike up and said, hey, what's the deal here? And he said, well, you know, one event in the collector actually usually results in multiple coming out the back end uh, on the richer side of things. So just taking the time to understand it within the machinery and even within your own ecosystem, what that looks like, um, uh, it, it's interesting, I'll say. Um, when you're self-hosting, you're subject to the general internet and also your corporate governance and security controls. So uh, there's a little bit of work that goes into filtering out that noise. Um, most recently, we had someone reach out to us from our web team and say, hey, um, Google, Google uh, bot seems to be chewing up a lot of our allowance on, this, on your particular endpoint. Um, can you look after that for us, please, so that we can spend that budget elsewhere? Um, you know, it takes a, a tiny little amount of fine tuning, but I think that as far as the noise reduction, well, the signal to noise ratio, I think is much better now than it was uh, initially. Um, and this one is probably a big one. And this is, this is where it's a, uh, a journey, not a sprint, is really unpicking your current assumptions of what's true uh, and your current implementations where your goal is to have a scalable and modern data platform where you may have a litany of tools or legacy or absolutely nothing in some cases. Um, unpicking that legacy where there's lots of strong opinions that are entrenched within teams about what good looks like and basically taking them on the organizational change to a company that is, um, is an adventure in its own right. Uh, and then just working, working across those teams to make sure that knowing what the change is that's necessary uh, hopefully with enough legwork done to make it really simple for them, but just working through the, the transition plan and executing on what that, what that looks like. Those are some of the initial challenges that, that we've gone through. There's probably a couple of others that I've, but those are the main ones. Right, so I, just to, I guess, sort of wrap things up, I think it's probably important for us to talk through a little bit about what kind of happens on the, the back end of this. Because um, I suspect this is possibly where a lot of people's implementations differ. Um, I imagine the the sort of event definitions and context definitions is one area, and then the sort of processing side of it. So, um, in in essence, the the top section here is basically what our data warehouse in Snowflake looks like. Um, we're split into two databases, um, Prod Raw and then Prod Analytics. So, Prod Raw is effectively the landing zone for everything. Um, on a schema division. So Snowplow's got its own schema in there. 
along with any other system that we're um, pumping raw data out of and into Snowflake for. Um, so our data processing um, layer of DBT um, doesn't have any write access to that layer. It's, it's entirely um, read only. Um, but where the fun stuff happens is in the product analytics database. Um, so in this one, instead of dividing by source system schemas, um, it's divided by kind of the le level of processing that's happened. Um, so we start with prod source, um, which is always a one-to-one -one mapping of our raw data in the, the layer there, um, just with PII redaction done um, and naming conventions enforced. Um, so there's every naming convention under the sun is used in some part of some third party system that we use or some internal system. Um, so that prod source layer gives us a really good opportunity to standardize that. Um, and DBT is responsible for maintaining those um, source mappings. Um, then the sort of, I guess, engine room of the analytic stack is in the prod prep layer. Um, so that's where we do our deduplication. Um, so we start breaking out common transforms um, and do a lot of the sort of lead, lead work underneath. And then finally, um, we're materializing assets that are basically designed for consumption by a specific system in our prod mart layer. So, you know, extracts or live views that are meant for Tableau, um, views that are meant to be, or materialized tables that are meant to be loaded into Braze, for instance, for segmentation, that type of stuff is, is what lives in prod mart. Um, and it, it's, I guess, really important to call out that the DBT is really fundamental in this stack. I, I think, and it, it's been a great help to us throughout this. So a lot of the things around being able to enforce testability on those data structures. So um, we've got all the events going to one common table, um, our Snowplow event table, basically. Um, and that's obviously quite sparse for all the different event types coming through. But once we're able to break out specific event types, um, we can then enforce the structural integrity of them um, on the processing side with DBT. So making sure stuff isn't null, that shouldn't be null. Um, if we're expecting um, to have relations, for instance, with um, other data sets like our customer tables, et cetera, um, we can enforce those relationships as they come through. Um, and then finally, the documentation side of stuff. So it's one thing to have, you know, all, all our schemas um, well documented at the um, sort of igloo schema level. Um, so that when we're reading it and we're making changes that we've got a clear understanding of what the intents of all those contexts and event types were. Um, but this also allows us then to basically enforce um, documentation standards on all the layers of processing. So if we come back to uh, a process that was defined on a certain snowplow event, you know, six, 12 months ago, um, we can go through and read the documentation to go, oh yeah, okay, that's what this event field was for, or that's what this event type was, um, or the event name was sort of intended to be used for. Um, and this is, again, one of those things that um, we enforce from the get-go. It's impossible to push a model into prod prep or prod mart without having full documentation done on it and full, at least one unique test on a column and at least one not null test on a column. Um, you can override them if you absolutely need to, but by default, those are enforced. Um, and it means that as we do grow and bring more people on into the team to work on this, um, we're able to maintain a really high standard of documentation and also data quality um, from those tests. So that I think pretty much covers um, how we've gone through the process of rolling out Snowplow at ZIP. Um, I don't know, Mike, is there time for questions if people have some or should we keep moving? Yeah, look, I think we've got time for questions. So if anyone's got any um, questions, feel free to, to jump in the, the chat. Um, I'll start you off with a bit of a question because I think adding that team owner information to, to schemas is really interesting. I know there's lots of folks that struggle with schemas in terms of who has ownership and who kind of defines that schema. Um, where does that, that sit for, for you and the team? Is that within a product team? Is it a centralized function? And, and how do you manage and communicate that, I suppose, internally? So was this the, who owns the schema definitions or who owns yeah. the event? Uh, the schema definitions themselves. Yeah. So I think it, at the moment, and this is all point of maturity type stuff, it's it's something that we started with being centrally owned because uh, it was something that we were, I think, led the very, very first implementation of. Um, it's changed a little bit now where it's kind of consultative, I'd say, and it will probably hold this pattern for a little bit where as we bring on new teams or new functions, um, it's 
it, it's kind of like Moss and I will go out and play consultant for 20 to 30 minutes when we're onboarding the use case, um, just to make sure that the rigor that we put into um, uh, the particularly the context definitions is where we get the majority of our reuse from uh, is either being utilized correctly or being extended in the appropriate way. Um, so I guess to that, to the, the TLDR of your question for now is probably that it's centrally owned for the most part. Um, ultimately, through the powers of source control, we want to open, uh, and it, it's ultimately this, how have we defined the structure that supports the publishing of the schemas? We'll leverage the version control and um, code owners, basically, I think, from a systematic perspective to help with you know, PR approvals to release any updates. Um, right now, everything comes to the one engineering or to our analytics and enablement team to, to release. So I think the, the next question we've got is, oh, sorry, was there any follow-ups there, Mike? Or? No, no, that, that, that sounds good. Wait, sorry, I've next? got a follow-up with that one, actually. just want to understand, um, how do you guys send that team information? Is that something that goes inside the page view schema? Is that right? Like when you give it an example? How do we enrich the app ideas of the team? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, um, it's in the enricher configuration. Uh, we, we take the app ID, which is fairly arbitrary if you're just taking it off the shelf. Um, we give the app ID to the team uh, because they're kept in a, uh, in a central registry, basically. Um, we thought briefly, very briefly about uh, some sort of canonical team ID, but then we just went, screw it, GUIDs are easy and they're fairly obscure and not guessable. Uh, so let's just give each app ID its own GUID and that's what we, that's what we carry. Um, the, the enrichment step is just the off-the-shelf API enrichment. It calls a, an app ID lookup and if the app ID that's supplied is either not a GUID or doesn't exist in the database, so it re replies with a or or a bad request, either of the two, which kicks the request out to the bad event uh, topic. And so in that database, we've got the team names and the other information oh, about yes. it. So yeah, that's how it gets attached on the um, enrichment. Yeah, so the, the response to that API call, assuming the app ID is found, is then converted to um, an internal context that we define uh, that's then carried with the message from there on out. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Next one in chat was: um, Did we have this architecture before you did Snowflake or Snowflake Snowplow? Sorry, oh, I did it again. Um, or did you build it around Snowplow? I, I think we get one for free. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was a, a bit of probably more the. Um, I was a bit chicken and egg. So um, the context for this was: We kind of had the opportunity um, early last year to kind of go, let's. Let's take a step back from, from everything um, at, in sort of the data analytics platform at, at Zip and go, um, what does good really, really look like? Um, so it's, it did start off as a um, relatively small problem in the sense of, hey, it'd be nice to clean up amplitude. Um, and we kind of went, well, actually, is that the problem here um, or is it bigger? And in the course of sort of going through exploring that, we realized that Look, cleaning up amplitude would maybe solve a little bit, but there's some, some more fundamental problems here in terms of like the accessibility of data, um, quality of it, et cetera. So we took a step back and looked at what the stack would be if we did it from scratch again. Um, I did a huge amount of research, talking to peers, um, understand what was working for them, what wasn't, um, and basically designed everything from the ground up, but being optimized for kind of as least effort for us to manage as possible, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. So like it, for the most part of it, it's been Trudy and I um, going through it. There's a few more people on the team now, um, but we were kind of trying to optimize for where we can plug stuff together and get a really good outcome. Um, that's what we were aiming for. So there was very deliberate choices around DBT works well with Snowplow, Snowflake works well with Snowplow. So sort of being able to capitalize on those was important to us. Um, there's one in here on Snowplow, Prodmart, send event data for race. Oh, no, okay, so this is interesting. Um, so the question being basically, do we route Snowplow event data into Braze at the moment? 
Um, this is kind of an ongoing topic of discussion, I would say here. Um, the short answer is- Not yet. Not yet. Um, this interestingly doesn't seem to be very well solved yet, I would say. The whole reverse ETL process on shipping like near-ish real time, if you like kind of comfortable with 15 minutes seems well solved. Um, routing of event streams outside of segment seems not, routing of event streams to third parties, I should say, outside of segment doesn't seem too well solved. But I did see a while ago that there was some movement on Snowplow around building some routing to third parties. Uh, I haven't seen anything on that for a while though. So I'd be super excited if that takes off saying that's for sure. Um, How does the FOD enrichment impact the latency? Um, well, this is, it's done in the enricher. So the, from a customer experience perspective, it doesn't. Um, I haven't seen any cases where it's added more than 100 milliseconds to the processing of a particular message. Your mileage may vary. Um, oh, I think there was one more. Can we see schema somewhere that Zip uses? It's available and consumer facing. I don't think it's public facing. It's not public facing, but if you know how the web tracker works and you live in Australia, go to zip.co slash au and you can probably unpack it from there. Mike's got a great plugin to help in Chrome. <laughs> um, that's probably the shortest answer. Like I, I'm also just conscious that we've got other presentations yeah. and speakers to get through. So um, we, can, we might be able to take that offline. Maybe.